Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's class. Today I will talk about deep learning. I will first review the brief history of deep learning and then introduce the theory and the sound math formula behind uh, the deep learning algorithms. Then finally, I will present the latest innovations and applications. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is actually a subfield of machine learning. And uh, machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. Therefore, in order to understand deep learning, we need to know the basic ideas of machine learning first. Machine learning is about teaching machines or computers to learn. It's based on probability and the statistics. So it's part of statistical learning. So what's the difference between classical programming and the machine learning? In classical programming, the programmers develop the rules. And when data come in, the program will generate the answers according to the rules developed by the programmer. So in classical programming, for example, like PowerPoint, when we type text or click our mouse, right, the PowerPoint will show the slides or the, the pictures or the text according to the pre-programmed -pre rules. Therefore, in classical programming, we need to write the code for each rule, right, each function or, by ourselves. Machine learning, on the other hand, uh, it doesn't need we to define all the rules. It can learn the rules automatically. So in machine learning, we provide the data and uh, sometimes uh, the answers. And also, there's one important uh, information. We need to provide the machine learning metrics, which let machine learning to evaluate how good uh, the, the learning is. And the machine learning algorithms will generate the rules automatically. So in machine learning, we provide data, uh, mostly data, and uh, sometimes answers and a metric. Uh, then machine learning we will learn the rules automatically. Generally speaking, there are three types of machine learning. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and uh, reinforcement learning. Let's start with supervised learning. So what's the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning? The difference is that the supervised learning has a teacher. The teacher will provide the answers of the training data. So the supervised learning requires uh, labeled data. For the answers, we also call the labels in machine learning labels. So the Supervised learning require labels. In fact, uh, teacher is just a good name of workers. Uh, it usually requires a lot of workers to label the uh, training data for supervised learning. For example, the most popular image classification data set, ImageNet. ImageNet has 14 million images, 14 million labeled images. Therefore, a labeling is actually a huge work. On the other hand, unsupervised learning uh, does not need labels, but we still need to provide a metric to evaluate at the performance of the model learned by unsupervised learning. However, that's all. So we don't need to provide huge labels for unsupervised learning. In this regard, 
unsupervised learning is more close to true human intelligence. However, the performance of unsupervised learning is much worse than supervised learning. So supervised learning is still the mainstream. Uh, recently, there's a new uh, type of machine learning called the self-supervised learning. Is between supervised learning and unsupervised learning, and uh, it uh, has uh, achieved a very good research result. Uh, we will talk more about self-supervised learning later. The third type of learning is reinforcement learning, which is about learning from your own mistakes. In short, reinforcement learning is about trial and error. plus delay reward. The algorithms keep learning from their own mistakes to achieve the maxima future cumulative reward. Researchers have different beliefs and assumptions of solving machine learning problems. We can Roughly classify uh, the machine learning algorithms into five tribes uh, based on their beliefs. The, the first one is evolutionaries. They believe the Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest. They will let different models compete with each other and keep the winning model. The two key factors of evolutionary is the mutation and the crossover. The second one is connectionist, which is cares about the connection of a network. So deep learning and the neural networks belong to this tribe. It is now the most popular tribe, connectionist. The third one, the symbolist. They prefer to learn the rules and the reasons behind the problem. The models learned by symbolists can be easily understand, uh, can be easily understood by human. The most representative algorithm of symbolist is the decision tree. The next one is Bayesians. The Bayesian algorithm is, is based on the Bayes theory, a famous theory in probability. The last one is uh, analogizers. They try to find an analogy between training data and the test data. They believe like father, like son. The input data that share the Similar features must belong to the same category. So here is a picture that illustrates the beliefs of different tribes. Different tribes are good for different types of problems. Actually, we can combine the, uh, the different uh, tribes and uh, uh, create a hybrid approach. For example, uh, it's very common now to first use the evolutionary to learn the architecture uh, of the neural network, right? To decide which uh, neuron we need to, we want to select, and then the, use the connectionist to learn the to to learn the parameters of each connection uh, to tune the parameters, and uh, then we can apply a a new approach called distillation or to try to find the rules behind the neural network. So then we combine the symbolist approach. The Bayesians is about the probability. So here is a histogram, histogram to show that the Bayesian is a statistical model. It's based on conditional probability. Okay, the last one is the Analogizer. Analogizer is uh, 
like I said, uh, they believe like father, like son, so they will try to find the most similar patterns in training data and then uh, classify the input as that category. The idea of five tribes was introduced in a book written by Pedro Domingos. He is a professor with Washington University. Uh, he believed that to solve the mystery of human intelligence, we need to find a algorithm that good at different, good at all kinds of problems. He called that algorithm the master algorithm. During his career, he uh, constantly uh, observed that the different tribes of algorithms are good for different kind of problems. So he uh, believed in the near future we can find the the master algorithm that you unite all different all the tribes. Right now, it looks like the deep learning is the uh, most promising candidate for the master algorithm. There are hundreds of algorithms, but the good news is all the algorithms can be represented by three basic operations. In other words, we can reduce all algorithms into three fundamental operations. So what are the operations? The first one is end operation. The end in logic design, we suppose we have a binary input. So the input is either one or zero. The end says that uh, suppose we have a different input. The first input is one and the second input is zero, then the output is zero. But it only output one if both inputs are one. So let's end. The second one is or. Or means the output will be one if one of the input is one. So it's a or. either uh, first input or second input is one, then the output is one, so it's over. The third fundamental operation is the most simple one. It's just invert the input, it's called not. So if the input is one, then the output is zero. And if the input is zero, then the output is one. If you have learned the logic design before, you know that uh, computers can be designed by those three basic operations, same as the algorithms. Here is another operation called XOR, exclusive OR. It is not a fundamental operation, but it is special. The XOR states that if the input uh, are the same, then the output will be zero. It will only the output will only be one if the inputs are different. So that's why it's called exclusive or. So if the inputs are one zero or zero one, then the output will be one. Otherwise, the outputs are zero. This uh, operation can be represented uh, by uh, five basic operations: two not, right? Two end gate and one or gate. The exclusive, uh, the XOR plays an important role in the neural network history. Uh, we will talk about it soon. Deep learning is actually the descendant of neural networks. So now let's talk about neural networks. 
Deep learning is based on artificial neural network, which is inspired by biological neural networks. Here is a picture of a neuron. A neuron is a cell that carries electrical impulses. A neuron is consists of three main parts. A cell body, a dendrite, and an axon. Dendrites uh, are the branches of neurons that receive signals from other neurons and uh, pass the signal to the cell body. Exon uh, can be over a meter long in humans and pass the electrical signal to other neurons. If the signals received uh, by the neuron uh, by another neuron are strong enough, and reach an action potential, then the neuron will be activated and output signals to other neurons. Have you ever wondered how many connections are there in the brain? Here are some numbers. For adults, there are around 10 to the power of 11 or 100 billion number of neurons in an adult brain. That's a huge number, but this is, this is only the number of neurons. Each neuron has around 1000 connections. So there are around 1000 connect connections per neuron. The connections are called synapses. So the total number of connections are 10 to the power of 14 or 100 trillion number of connections. In fact, the number of connections in the brain is as many as the number of stars in our galaxy. Inspired by the biological neuron, a researcher called Frank Rosenbaum has developed the first prototype of neuron called perceptron in 1957. Perceptron used weighted sound the sigma represents sound and the, the weight uh, are w okay so the perceptron used the weighted sound uh, to represent dendrites and the threshold to control the action potential so here the input are x from x1 to xn and uh, each x has a corresponding weight from weight 1 to weight n one spatial input is uh, x0, which is 1, and uh, the weight w0 is used as a threshold, or sometimes we call bias. So w0 is actually can affect the next output uh, to the as a threshold. We'll see better representation in next slide. So once we have calculated the weighted sum of the input, then we can use an activation function. Here the activation function is just compared with zero. If the weighted sum is larger than zero, or the weighted sum is larger than zero, then the output is one. Otherwise, the output is zero. In 1950s, there is no computers these days. Dr. Rosenbaum designed a hardware device to implement the function. Although the idea of perceptron is very similar to the neurons in today's deep learning, Rosenbaum didn't develop a mechanism to train multi-layer neural networks. So the performance of perceptron was not very well. Here is a modern math model of a neuron. This picture is extracted from a class of Stanford called CS231 which is taught by Professor Li Feifei. CS231 is the most famous free computer vision class online. Okay, so the input from another neuron is represented by X. So the input from other neurons are from X1, X0 to X2. So watch out the main difference between this model and the model of Frank Rosenbaum. Here, the input x0 is also from other neurons, while the input x0 in Frank Rosenbaum is uh, biased. So, uh, 
the input is from x0 to xn. So where is the bias? Where is the threshold? The threshold is now is here. We use B to represent the bias. And then the output will go through an activation function, F. So F is the activation function. Now the uh, neuron uh, is reformulated as this one on the weighted sum of the input from other neurons and plus a bias and go through an activation function. This is the modern math formula for uh, a neuron. This formula clearly show that we can use a bias to uh, change the threshold, uh, the activate action potential of a neuron. Several years after the perceptron was proposed, the researchers still could not improve the performance of the model. In 1969, Marvin Minsky, founder of the MIT AI lab, has published a book called Perceptrons. In this book, Minsky showed many research results about neural networks and all of them are uh, very pessimistic. Finally, his book uh, concludes that neural networks are dead. One of the most famous example is that perceptron cannot uh, learn XOR. So we have seen XOR in previous uh, slide. So why uh, perceptron cannot do XOR? Let me show you an example. Suppose uh, this is the input of A, uh, the output, the input of A and the B. Uh, if uh, both are both inputs are zero, both inputs are zero, and uh, the output is zero uh, here. If both uh, inputs are one uh, then the output is zero huh? otherwise if one of the uh, input is one and another one is zero then the output is one huh? so let me use different color to represent output so if both uh, b and a are zero then the output is zero huh? of course if both uh, both are one then output is zero. Otherwise, if A is 1 and B is 0, then output is 1. And uh, if the B is 1, A is 0, then output is 1. So the problem is uh, we cannot find a linear classifier uh, to separate uh, the 1 and 0, right? Uh, we cannot find a linear uh, classifier uh, that can separate, uh, separate 1 from zero. Right. So we need a nonlinear nonlinear classifier to classify uh, one and zero. Right. Okay, so that's the problem uh, of perceptron. A linear classifier is uh, a line, uh, so you cannot find a line that separate zero and one because it's not linearly separable. Because Minsky is the world famous AI researcher, this book has caused the first AI winter because he make most researchers believe that the neural networks has no hope. So his book uh, led to the first AI winter, and the neural networks has widely been rejected by major uh, machine learning conferences. Many AI visions have never become reality. Investors have become impatient with the slow progress in artificial intelligence, which led to AI winter from 1969 to 1990s. In fact, AI had made a short comeback in the 1980s. But in general, artificial intelligence has become a non-mainstream research in this period. Who is the white knight who saved the AI winter? Actually, there were three white knights. 
The first one is Geoffrey Hinton. He's now the head of Google brand. The second is Yang Lacken. He's the head of uh, Facebook AI research. And the third is Yosha Bengio. The big three have reinvent the neural network and call it deep learning. They won the 2018 Turing Award together. The Turing Prize is considered as the Nobel Prize in the field of computer science. Another important deep learning researcher is Andrew Erno. He is the professor of Stanford University and has founded Coursera, one of the largest online learning platform. His deep learning course is the best online course and it's free. However, uh, Andrew is younger than the other three uh, researchers, so he didn't win the uh, turning prize with the big three. Anyway, they are good friends and uh, respect each other. The winter for neural networks has been continued for more than a decade. The hero came to the rescue is Geoffrey Hinton who showed that the XOR can be learned by using multi-layer perceptrons using backpropagation. Although the idea has been conceived by other researchers before, it's Hinton's paper that clearly addressed the problems proposed by Minsky. So he is considered as the father of deep learning. Here is an example. So uh, Minsky was right that one perceptron cannot learn XOR, but if we use multiple perceptrons, we can learn the XOR network, and there are more than one solution. Here Hinton just showed one possible solution. Let's check the network. The tau is the threshold. So suppose we have two inputs, both inputs are one, right? And uh, after uh, the uh, weighted sum, uh, so the one is the weight, uh, the weight of the input. So both input are one. So uh, in this case, the weighted sum is two, right? And the two is larger than the threshold, uh, one point and. Uh, 9 1.9 so it will output act it output will be activated and the output minus 1 1 plus the minus 1 right on the other hand though in this case uh, 2 is larger than 0 so the output is also 1 right but this time is multiplied by uh, positive 1 so it's one also one the final result is one minus one equals zero so we so the xor network uh, is correct you may wonder that using multiple perceptrons to replace one perceptron the idea seems so simple why no one proposed this idea before in fact Everybody wanted to use multiple perceptrons, but it was difficult to train the network. So Hinton proposed an algorithm called backpropagation, which can train multiple layer perceptrons effectively. How backpropagation works? Let me introduce how machine learning models work. There are two stages in machine learning algorithms, training and inference. For inference, we make predictions by calculate the algorithms, calculate the parameters starting from the input layer. In neural network, this process is called forward pass. So to make a prediction, we need to calculate the parameters 
from the input layer to the output layer. Then we will get a prediction result or the prediction output. The predicted output is then compared with the labels to calculate the error. To train the model, we need to propagate the error, or propagate the error back to the neurons and adjust the weights. This is called the backward pass, backward pass. And this is the process of training, or we can say learning. After training the model, we can use the model by just calculating the forward pass to make predictions. This process is called inference or testing. For example, if we received an input image, then we can just calculate the forward pass and then make a prediction. Then the predict result is uh, maybe human face. In the training process, we need a lot of data. So we need a large amount of data. And we need to repeat the training process, uh, repeat the forward and the back propagation uh, cycle until we minimize the, the error. So training is a long and time-consuming process. On the other hand, the inference is much faster because we only need to calculate the forward pass and make the prediction. What is the magical math formula used for back propagation? It turns out the age old calculus, the chain rule. The chain rule uh, can let us calculate the derivatives of each function one by one and uh, multiply together. So naturally, we can use chain rule to calculate the gradient of the multi-layer neural networks. The open source deep learning framework like Cafe, or TensorFlow, or PyTorch, they all use the chain rule to calculate the gradient and the train neural networks. Let's see an example to help us understand the process of training and inference. Uh, this example is recognizing handwritten digits. The digits are from a data set called MNIST, which uh, was prepared by Yang Lacken. There are 60,000 images for training and 10,000 images for testing. Our goal is to train a neural network that can recognize the handwritten digits from 0 to 9. A typical neural network has multiple layers. Suppose we have four layers, and this is the output result of layer 4, the output vector. Note that in classification problem, the, uh, the number, the dimension of the output vector, uh, the number of outputs in the data set uh, in a vector should be the same as the number of class uh, we want to predict. In this case, uh, we have 10 classes uh, in the uh, MNIST data set. Uh, the 10 classes are from 0 to 9, uh, the numbers. Uh, from 0 to 9. Whenever we receive uh, an image input, we will convert it into a vector. Uh, and the, the, vector, the vector data will go through multiple layers and the, do the calculation or do the forward calculation. And finally, it will output a vector uh, with 10 dimension. Uh, the dimension is 10. And uh, hopefully, uh, the output is the probability uh, of each class. And hopefully, the probability of uh, being 4, uh, the probability of that the input image is 4, is the highest. Uh, then we will predict that the input image is 4. Suppose we use convolution neural networks to learn uh, to predict 
an image input. Uh, we will talk about the details of uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, CNN later. And uh, usually uh, CNN will learn the features of the image uh, in each layer. Okay, so here are some examples. Uh, usually the first layer, the first layer will learn uh, some small features of the input images. And then the higher or the later, the deeper the layers, the more the more semantic the features are. And finally, we will want to output the properties of each class. Now I want to play some videos from a famous math YouTuber called Three Blue One Brown. He has made a lot of amazing videos about uh, mathematics and uh, deep learning. His name is Grant Sanderson. This is a somewhat classic example for introducing the topic. And I'm happy to stick with the status quo here, because at the end of the two videos, I want to point you to a couple good resources where you can learn more, and where you can download the code that does this and play with it on your own computer. These digits are rendered on a 28 by 28 pixel grid, each pixel with some grayscale value between 0 and 1. Those are what determine the activations of 784 neurons in the input layer of the network. And then the activation for each neuron in the following layers is based on a weighted sum of all the activations in the previous layer, plus some special number called a bias. Then you compose that sum with some other function, like the sigmoid squishification or a ReLU, the way that I walked through last video. In total, given the somewhat arbitrary choice of two hidden layers here with 16 neurons each, the network has about 13,000 weights and biases that we can adjust. And it's these values that determine what exactly the network, you know, actually does. Then what we mean when we say that this network classifies a given digit is that the brightest of those 10 neurons in the final layer corresponds to that digit. And remember, the motivation that we had in mind here for the layered structure was that maybe the second layer could pick up on the edges, and the third layer might pick up on patterns like loops and lines, and the last one could just piece together those patterns to recognize digits. So here, we learn how the network learns. What we want is an algorithm where you can show this network a whole bunch of training data, which comes in the form of a bunch of different images of handwritten digits, along with labels for what they're supposed to be, and it'll adjust those 13,000 weights and biases so as to improve its performance on the training data. Hopefully, this layered structure will mean that what it learns generalizes to images beyond that training data. And the way we test that is that after you train the network, you show it more labeled data that it's never seen before, and you see how accurately it classifies those new images. Fortunately for us, and what makes this such a common example the most popular training algorithm is gradient descent. It's a first order iterative optimization algorithm for minimizing an error function. In this figure, the y axis is the loss function, the z of w is the loss function, or we can call it error function. Our goal is to minimize the loss, minimize the loss by changing the parameters of our network, which is also called weights. The weights are represented by W. Usually the W represents a vector. So our goal is by changing W to minimize the J of W. So it's similar to finding the lowest point in this figure. In other words, the procedure is similar to finding the deepest point in a valley. Let me briefly uh, introduce the training process. Initially, we don't know where is the lowest point or the deepest point in this figure. So we randomly initialize our weight, W. Suppose we initialize our weight here then we will get the loss function uh, j of w here, right? Okay, so how do we know where to uh, move? Uh, where is the direction uh, can minimize the, the loss, uh, minimize the error? 
So uh, the approach is to first calculate the gradient. So by calculate the gradient, you can we can calculate the slope at this point on the j of w function. Then we know where to move. We can move down or move up. If we move down, it's called the gradient descent because we want to minimize the loss. Okay. So by calculate gradient, we know where to move. Then we can move to here. Then we can calculate the gradient again, then move again, and uh, gradient again, then move again. Until we move to a point that the loss uh, didn't decrease, uh, the loss are, uh, uh, are this, uh, very similar and not change, uh, are not changing very large. Uh, so that's the point, uh, so that's the possible minima. Okay. In this example, the cost function is simple and the global minima is here. The global minima can be discovered. However, in complex high dimension vector space, it is not guaranteed to find the local minima. The good news is researchers found that there are many local minima that are almost as good as global minima. So we are not necessary to search for the global minima. However, this issue is why deep learning is hard to train because it's not guaranteed to find the global minima. Finding global minima is very difficult. In previous example, there is only one variable w. Now suppose we have two variables theta 0 and theta 1. Then we can visualize the surface of the cost function j of theta 0 and theta 1 in a 3D space. We cannot visualize uh, the cost surface with more than two variables. So in practice, we have uh, millions or billions of variables, so we cannot visualize it. But visualize two variables can give out a big picture of what happened in training. In this example, I want to show you how the slight difference in initialized weight may lead to large different results. So if we our initial weights are here, then following the gradient descent, we may reach these local minima. On the other hand, if we have slightly different initialized weight or initial weights, then we may lead to this local minima or much different local minima. So training a deep learning model is very common that every time or every time you run a training, you get slightly different results. Let's see an example of calculating gradient. One of the popular cost functions is the mean squared error. Okay. Suppose the prediction is, uh, is the f theta. So if we get an input xi, then we can use the prediction model f theta to calculate our prediction. Then we want to measure the error, the difference between the prediction and the, the true value or the true answer, which is the labels. So we calculate the difference and get the square because we want to measure the magnitude. Usually we have multiple samples, so we will make multiple predictions on the training data or test data. Then calculate difference between the ground truths, the true labels. Then we can calculate the average of the square error. It's called the mean squared error. Now we can calculate a gradient using chain rules. So we first calculate the derivative of the square error, right? So it's straightforward. We move the square to uh, become a constant of the error function. Then it the error function becomes the first order. The f theta of x i minus y i. So it's a change from square function to a simple subtraction. 
then we uh, need to calculate the derivative of based on the chain rule we need to calculate the derivative of f theta of xi on and multiply those two functions together so that's the gradient of mean square error okay so then we can use the gradient to update the parameters of theta of theta j all the parameters in our model okay, and then we will see if the loss function uh, after the update of weight, the loss uh, is smaller. We repeat this process. We repeat this process until the loss does not change much. This is called uh, convergence. So the training process is a, a iterative process. We keep uh, reduce the parameters. Uh, update our parameters using the gradient it's called descent because we subtract uh, the gradient and note there's a parameter called alpha alpha control the, uh, the speed uh, we call it a learning rate control the learning rate of our parameters uh, so usually we select a small alpha like 0 0.01 we continue uh, this iterative process until the loss uh, does not change much it's called convergence. So we repeat the gradient descent until convergence. We can use one sample at a time to update the weights, or we can use a group of uh, samples. It's called a, a bench. We can use a bench of samples to update uh, the parameters. It's called a mini bench, or we can use the whole training data uh, to update the parameters. It actually depends on the memory of your computer or, or more specifically your graphics card right, or your GPU. If your GPU have a large uh, memory, then you can update the parameters using the whole bench uh, to calculate the error, the loss of using a, a whole bench of your training data. So what's the difference? Uh, usually uh, when you uh, use only one sample, uh, each time it's called stochastic training when it becomes not uh, unstable you will take it will take you longer time to convergence because uh, the one sample is not very stable so it will, it will take uh, usually it takes more time to converge uh, on the other hand if you select a group of uh, Samples, it's called the mini bench. So you can select a small mini bench to train your data, right? So it will converge faster because a group of data will have better uh, representation of your whole data set, right? Of course, if you have enough memory, you can use the whole bench, or usually it's converge faster. But sooner or later, uh, Ideally, they will converge to the similar place uh, unless they are stuck at some uh, local minima. Uh, usually, we prefer to use the mini bench approach, uh, more stable uh, uh, with a uh, reasonable memory. Just imagine a simple function that has one number as an input and one number as an output. How do you find an input that minimizes the value of this function? Calculus students will know that you can sometimes figure out that minimum explicitly, but that's not always feasible for really complicated functions. Certainly not in the 13,000 input version of this situation for our crazy complicated neural network cost function. A more flexible tactic is to start at any old input and figure out which direction you should step to make that output lower. Specifically, if you can figure out the slope of the function where you are, then shift to the left if that slope is positive, and shift the input to the right if that slope is negative. If you do this repeatedly, at each point checking the new slope and taking the appropriate step, you're going to approach some local minimum of the function. And the image you might have in mind here is a ball rolling down a hill. And notice, even for this really simplified single input function, there are many possible valleys that you might land in depending on which random input you start at. And there's no guarantee that the local minimum you land in is going to be the smallest possible value of the cost function. That's going to carry over to our neural network case as well. And I also want you to notice how if you make your step sizes proportional to the slope, then when the slope is flattening out towards the minimum, 
Your steps get smaller and smaller, and that kind of helps you from overshooting. Bumping up the complexity a bit, imagine instead a function with two inputs and one output. You might think of the input space as the xy plane, and the cost function as being graphed as a surface above it. Now instead of asking about the slope of the function, you have to ask which direction should you step in this input space so as to decrease the output of the function most quickly. In other words, what's the downhill direction? And again, it's helpful to think of a ball rolling down that hill. Those of you familiar with multivariable calculus will know that the gradient of a function gives you the direction of steepest ascent. Basically, which direction should you step to increase the function most quickly? Naturally enough, taking the negative of that gradient gives you the direction to step that decreases the function most quickly. And even more than that, the length of this gradient vector is actually an indication for just how steep that st The neural network we have just learned is called fully connected or densely connected networks. Because for each layer, each output is connected to all the inputs of the next layer. So they are called uh, the fully connected layers. Now let's talk about another type of uh, neural network. It's called convolutional neural networks. The convolutional neural network was introduced by Jan Lacken in 1990s for recognized handwritten digits. Convolution is a mathematical operation that has been widely used in many engineering fields, such as digital signal processing, electrical engineering, and physics. In image processing, the convolution operations are 2D filters, which can be applied to extract different image features. The training process is to adjust the parameters uh, of filters to minimize the errors between uh, the predicted uh, predictions and the labels. So here is the architecture proposed by uh, Young Lacken, so it's called LaNet. This architecture is very similar to modern convolutional neural network. So the first, this is the input image, so not a layer of a neural network. And uh, for the first layer, there are a lot of convolutional filters. Each filter is used to extract features. Well, the feature is some uh, uh, distinctive uh, pixels of an image. So the filter will filter the features, uh, then it will do subsampling. The uh, purpose of subsampling is to uh, first reduce the number of data and, and uh, let the filter get focus on larger area of the image. Usually the second convolution layer will learn uh, more high level features or features because of the subsampling. And finally, uh, they are, uh, the output of convolution uh, layer will go through several uh, full connection or fully connection Full uh, layers of uh, right, of uh, it's called a full connection here, <clears throat> and the final output is uh, a ten-dimensional vector, right? Because uh, we want to classify ten uh, class uh, from the hand written the hand written digits from zero to nine. So there are ten classes. Convolutional neural networks have been widely used for image recognition. Before introducing more CNN architectures, let us uh, talk about ImageNet first. Because ImageNet played an important role in CNN history, ImageNet is a large scale image database created by Professor Fei Fei Li uh, and her group in Stanford University. There are around uh, 20,000 categories and 14 million images. The latest statistics are updated in uh, update on September 21st, 2022. 
2021. Oh, there are around uh, 14 million images and uh, uh, 21,841 classes in ImageNet database. Why is ImageNet important? It is a data set, not an architecture. This is because deep learning need big data. In computer vision, deep learning models has been outperformed by uh, traditional shadow models like SVN before ImageNet uh, was published. The big data of ImageNet helped the renaissance of deep learning. This is what happened. So uh, Professor Fei Fei Li select 10,000 categories from ImageNet and held a ImageNet large-scale visual object recognition. It's called ILSVRC, a challenge, a competition in 2010. The participating teams would evaluate their algorithms on the given data set and compete to achieve higher accuracy on several visual recognition tasks. So ILSVRC stimulated the advancement of technology. In 2012, the students of Hinton joined the challenge and proposed a CNN model known as AlexNet now. So AlexNet won the challenge with large margin and spurred a deep learning boom. Okay, so what's in the image net? Uh, uh, large scale uh, visual object recognition challenge. Uh, there are 1,000 1, categories, uh, 1,000 classes. And uh, for the IRS VRC 2017, uh, uh, there are around uh, 700 to uh, 1,300. Uh, Trending images for each category, for each category, and uh, there are additional fifty thousand validation images and uh, one hundred thousand test images. So the total number of images in RS VRC data sets around the one million and the one hundred fifty thousand images. There are the error rates of previous ILO SVRC winners. The y-axis unit is error rate, so the lower the better. The winners of 2010 and 2011 use algorithms based on support vector machine, so uh, which is considered as a shallow method in contrast to deep learning. The lower the better. So the winner, we can see that the winner of Iris VRC in 2010 the error rate is around 28.2. It's gradually reduced uh, each year, uh, every year, with the advancement of the shadow method. Uh, but uh, the breakthrough uh, came in in 2012. When uh, Hinton student Alex uh, had joined the competition, used the deep learning method. Uh, so the Hinton student Alex Propose to use convolution neural network to join the ILSVRC. His architecture is here. He proposed to train the convolution neural network on GPU, the graphics processing unit made by NVIDIA 2012. Basically, the CN architecture is very similar to the LaNet, which was proposed in 1990s but the difference is that there are two branches of the networks but it is not uh, an architectural innovation this is because the memory of the gpu uh, in 2012 uh, was not large enough so alex has to separate his model on two different branch uh, two different uh, gpu cards and create two branches of his model but basically, the architecture uh, is very similar to the net. First, uh, it has the input of the image net image with the size uh, 224 by 224. And then it's applied the convolution, uh, 3D convolution to the image. 
and uh, is uh, applied max pooling now. Lanet use average pooling, but Alex used the uh, max pooling, right? Uh, so convolution max pooling, convolution max pooling. Uh, and finally, there are two fully connected, uh, two uh, dense layers. Uh, the final output is uh, a vector, uh, uh, 1000D dimensional vector, because there are 1000 categories in ImageNet. Uh, AlexNet also introduced some techniques we used today, uh, like the ReLU, uh, activation function, and uh, dropout uh, for training. Here is the error rate of Alex Nate. The error rate is uh, 16.4, which is almost 38% uh, lower than previous winner uh, in 2011, which was based on a shadow method. So there were uh, uh, a lot of researchers skeptical of deep learning, but they own uh, become the believers of deep learning after seeing the promising result of AlexNet. So after AlexNet, the deep learning methods dominate the iOS VRC challenge. Okay, and uh, the uh, error, error rate keeps uh, lowering, uh, keeps lowering. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the researchers found that the, the deeper uh, the model, the better the performance. So the researchers start to uh, study the deeper model. That's why it's called deep learning. So they try to uh, increase the number of layers in a model, or make it deeper. The winner in 2014 has uh, 19 layers, and the winner, uh, Google Net, in 2014 has 22 layers. And uh, finally, in 2015, uh, uh, the researchers from Microsoft Research Asia has uh, proposed a model called ResNet and push the limit of the, uh, the the depth of the model to 152 layers. Okay. And one thing to note is that it's the first time that the uh, accuracy or the error rate is lower than human. Huh? So uh, deep learning model has had achieved has achieved the human level accuracy in 2015. Although the human level accuracy was uh, made by only one human, uh, Andrei Parfi, a uh, PhD student, because uh, not many people want to uh, see through all the test images in ImageNet. Remember, there are uh, 100,000 images. Uh, in the test data set of ImageNet. Here are the network architecture of some important CNN models. Uh, we won't go the, through the details here, uh, but we can see the overall trend of CNN architecture. Uh, the first is LANET. Uh, after LANET, uh, here is the AlexNet and the VGG, right? Uh, the winners of uh, iOS VRC. And the trend is that the network become deeper. Then uh, the winner of uh, Google Net uh, proposed the branch, right, uh, multiple branches of the neural network. Uh, the previous models are uh, sequential because they don't have branch. Uh, so Google Lanet proposed the branch of uh, the inception cell. Uh, then uh, based on Google Nate, uh, there are more architectural code inception v3, v3 inception v4. So the deep learning researchers found that they need to go deeper. Here is a picture from a wonderful movie, which happens to be called Inception. Researchers knew that deeper architecture can achieve better performance. But if the architecture becomes too deep, the error rate increases. This is due to a problem called vanish gradient, which states that the gradients become too small after uh, too many layers. This problem is straightforward because after multiple layers of uh, 
uh, chain rule uh, calculate the derivatives uh, the information becomes very small and to solve this problem uh, in 2015 the researchers from Microsoft Asia proposed uh, the residual network the residual network idea is simple it ends a skip connection a skip connection to pass the information to several layers at later right so there are now two paths one is go through the original layers another one is to skip the layers and pass the information to later layers and in here it will try to add the identity connection so this is just a copy of the information it is the uh, information passed through the layers, the f of x plus the identity information. The re residual network uh, can make sure that uh, we need to have better performance after the deeper layer. Uh, otherwise, we can just use the identity connection uh, and pass the uh, x information uh, instead of go through the multiple uh, layers. By using this trick, uh, the ResNet can successfully push the uh, depth of a neural network to 152 layer. Uh, that's a great achievement. Now, uh, almost all modern neural networks uh, have the skip connection inside. Uh, you may wonder that uh, the researchers have already pushed the limit to 152 in 2015. What now? In fact, uh, uh, the depth of the model is still around uh, 30 to 50. Uh, researchers have tried to push the limit to 1000 layers, uh, but uh, didn't find any better results on ImageNet dataset. In fact, in the original paper of ResNet, uh, the author has achieved similar results using only 34 layers. Uh, so here's the 34 layer version. Uh, so far, it seems that uh, 30 to 50 layers uh, are deep enough. There are two good visual comparison of CNN models. The picture on the left shows the accuracy, top one accuracy of different CNN models. The accuracy is the higher the better. We can see that the AlexNet is around 55% accuracy. You, you may wonder why uh, the error rate uh, of AlexNet was around 16, right? So the accuracy should be around 84. But uh, here is the top one accuracy. The error rate report in previous slide was top five accuracy, which means if one of the top five recommend image uh, match the labels, then the prediction uh, is correct. So uh, it's not very uh, practical because in reality you only see the top one accuracy. So here the top one accuracy is a better metric for the accuracy. So the picture on the right is more interesting. It not only show the top one accuracy but also show the number of operations. The number of operations is in proportional to the number of parameters in a model. So the larger the circle, the more operations or the more parameters of the model. In this picture, we can see that uh, the ResNet, although it's much deeper than VGG16, uh, which has 16 layers and the 19, uh, which has 19 layers. Although the 50, uh, ResNet has 50 layers and uh, even 101 layers. They have less operation and less parameters than VGG. Thanks for the uh, skip connection and other techniques. So uh, the ResNet uh, and uh, the following inception V4.
are very efficient and accurate. Now let's talk about another important architecture called recurrent neural networks uh, and uh, its variant uh, long short term memory LSTM. One problem of CNN models uh, and other feed forward networks is that they don't consider the interdependency of sequential data such as speech or uh, text. The temporal relations are important for natural language understanding or speech recognition. For example, the Mary had a little lamb. The owner of the lamb, Mary, is mentioned in the beginning of the sentence. The recurrent neural network solves this problem by ending a loop, a loop in the hidden layers. It's also called a feedback. The loop can keep previous states of sequential data, which remember the temporal information. It may not be clear how loops in hidden layers can be used to remember information. We can unroll the RNN loop to better understand this mechanism. Here is a good figure from Kola's blog. So here's the loop. We can unroll the loop on time domain. Suppose we have a sequential data, sequential input data x0, x1, x2 to xt, which means the data is coming at time 0, time 1, time 2, to time t. The input data x are coming sequentially then the recurrent layer generates output also sequentially it can generate the h0 h1 h2 right depending on the input x so in this case you can see that the output of h1 depends on not only x1 but also the output results of previous times step x0 right so by unrolling the RNN on time domain we can see that the RNN indeed consider the information of previous time right remember we still only have one neuron in RNN but we can expand RNN on time domain from this figure we can see that the loopback mechanism which is also called a recurrent uh, mechanism, uh, is equivalent to keep information for next step. There are many variants of RNN. The most important one is the long short term memory, LSTM. LSTM was proposed to address some important issues of RNN. First, the RNN cannot remember the information uh, uh, long time ago. In other words, uh, the RNN suffers the same managed gradient problem uh, like CNN, but is uh, due to the information was uh, appeared a long time ago, so the RNN cannot remember it. Uh, another problem. Uh, on the contrary, is that RNN cannot forget unimportant information. To address those issues, LSTM proposed first a forward path for LSTM. So there's one forward path. If we want to keep the information, we can uh, open the gate. So there are several gates controlled by activation function. If the activation function output is zero, then the information is multiplied by zero, which means the gate is closed. If the output of the activation function is one, which means pass through the previous information is passed pass through the path. So this forward path is like the skip connection. 
LSPN was proposed a uh, uh, long time ago, uh, so actually the LSPN had has invented the skip connection uh, earlier. And then uh, another important uh, function is the forget gate. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the LSTN can learn forget some unimportant or out of date information. So LSTN achieved the forget function by the three gates. Uh, one is the input gate, uh, the other one is the output gate, and the, the third is the update gate. The three gate uh, can control if to forget uh, the information or update the new input or, or update the uh, input to, uh, to the output to combine the previous information and the input to output a new output. Another important innovation in last decade is deep reinforcement learning, which has achieved the holy grail of artificial intelligence, defeat humans in the game of Go. What is reinforcement learning? In its simplest form, reinforcement learning is trial and error plus delayed reward. Trial and error means learn from your own mistakes, while delayed reward means our goal of learning is to maximize the cumulative reward in the end. In order to learn from our own mistakes, we need an environment that can allow us to do trial and error, huh? trial and fail, trial and fail again and again. This environment is called model in reinforcement learning. So there's a software agent. The agent wants to learn a model. But please be careful that the model here in reinforcement learning is called policy pi. Policy pi. And the model which we mentioned before in reinforcement learning means the environment. That's a little bit confusing. Okay, so the uh, agent uh, wants to learn a policy pi, uh, which can uh, maximize its cumulative future reward. So the agent will perform trial and error. The, his, the first try is called an action AT. Uh, the try at time t is called action AT. Once the agent performed an action in the in, environment. Uh, the environment need to have some interactions with the agent. First, the environment will provide the observations, which is the current state of the environment, st, uh, the current state at time t. And another most important uh, thing of reinforcement learning is that uh, the, environment, the environment need to provide a reward. So the environment provides observation and reward to the agent. So the agent need to uh, learn the policy function which uh, can decide uh, what action uh, AT uh, under the observation of ST uh, can uh, optimize the cumulative future reward. In previous slides we have learned the basics of reinforcement learning. Now let's talk about the reason advanced in deep reinforcement learning. Deep reinforcement learning are largely uh, made by the DeepMind company. DeepMind was founded by David Hasabis, Shem Lek, and uh, Mustaf Suleiman in 2010. The goal of the founders is to create a general purpose AI that can be useful and effective for learning almost anything. Because the founders are has background in game industry, they start training AI agents how to play old Atari games that were popular in 1970s and 80s. On January 26, in 2014, Google announced the company has acquired DeepMind for 500 million 
The company made headlines worldwide in 2016 after its AlphaGo program beat a human world champion gold player, Li Sudong. DeepMind published their first breakthrough algorithm, Deep Q Learning DQN, on Nature. The title of the paper is Human Level Control Through Deep Reinforcement Learning in 2015. Here are some examples of AI playing Atari games in OpenAI Gym. OpenAI Gym is an open source reinforcement learning simulation environment released by OpenAI. We will use OpenAI Gym to try some algorithms later. When training AI playing Atari games via reinforcement learning, the environment is the Atari game console. Here is the picture of the game console, which was uh, made in 1970s. And the reward is the score of the game. Reward is the scores. And the state is the screenshots. Uh, the actions are the directions of buttons of the joysticks. DeepMind was very ambitious. They want to create a general interior intelligence so they didn't pre-process the game uh, screenshot or they didn't try to label the objects or enemies they just uh, send the state uh, the whole screen into the into the model so they just use the use the raw pixels of the screenshot as their input as their state so this makes the possible states very huge the number of poss possible states is very large. The most famous success story of DeepMind is AlphaGo. In 2016, AlphaGo won the five-game goal match against the 18-time world champion Li Sudong and lost only one game, which is the last game won by human. After AlphaGo, after this match, AlphaGo has sweep the human opponents. No professional Go player can win AlphaGo right now. Go was considered the holy grail of human intelligence because previous algorithms can only beat uh, mature players. This is indeed a great achievement in human history. Actually, there is one Taiwanese that worked for the AlphaGo team. His name is Aja Huang. He studied PhD in National Normal University. David Silver, the previous professor who told the best reinforcement online course and now working in DeepMind, uh, find the paper of Aja Huang and very impressive about his work about, of Go. So he invited Aja Huang to work in London and they published the paper of AlphaGo together. Aja Huang is the co first author of uh, AlphaGo and uh, he is the hand of AlphaGo when playing against Li Sudong. Here is the photo when Aja Huang is playing for DeepMind uh, for AlphaGo. Why is defeating humans in the game of Go was considered as the holy grail of artificial intelligence? This is because that the complexity of Go is much higher than other chess games. Here is a comparison table of different chess games. We can see that uh, because the board size of Go is larger than other games, which is uh, 19 by 19. So the state space and the game tree size all much larger than other chess game. This makes training a uh, model for Go very difficult. Before our Go, the best AI players uh, can only defeat the immature human players.
AlphaGo is indeed a great breakthrough in human history. DeepMind continued pushing the limit after beating the human world champion in October 2017. DeepMind introduced AlphaGo Zero, which learns Go without the rivalry and the human play records. In other words, it's starting from scratch. So it's called AlphaGo Zero. Eventually, no one can understand the strategies behind the moves of AlphaGo Zero which are beyond human comprehension. Let's see the learning progress of AlphaGo Zero. Uh, the AlphaGo Zero has no prior knowledge of the game and only the basic rules as input. Uh, after three days, AlphaGo Zero surpassed the ability of AlphaGo Li, the version that beat the champion Li Sudong in 2016. After 21 days, AlphaGo reached the level of AlphaGo Master, the version that defeated 60 top professional online and world champion Gertie in 3 out of 3 games in 2017. After 40 days, AlphaGo Zero surpassed all other versions of AlphaGo and arguably becomes the best Go player in the world. In short, AlphaGo has become the best Go player in the world in just 40 days and it did that entirely from self-play, without any human intervention and using no historical data. In 2020, DeepMind has made another breakthrough. This time it's in biology. The model called AlphaFold 2. So AlphaFold is used to predict the 3D structure of a port porting. Portings are important to life. Our body has consists of portings. So portings are large and complex molecules made up of chains of amino acids. Biologist wants to predict the 3D structure of portings based on the chains of the amino acids. If we can do that, we can uh, uh, make many new applications in biology. Predicting uh, what shapes proteins fold into uh, is called the protein folding problem. Alpha 4 2 has achieved the highest uh, accuracy on a 3D protein prediction dataset, which is one of the largest breakthroughs in biology. It shows how AI can be effective in medical industry. After learning so many amazing deep learning innovations, let's talk about the limits of deep learning. The first problem is that deep learning has no idea of real world. Although we cannot say other models has uh, idea of real world, but deep learning with the millions to billions of parameters, it's very difficult to find the rules that learned by the model. Here's a technique uh, meant, introduced by Hinton, it's called distillation, which can try to find uh, the rules or uh, reduce the number of parameters in deep learning models. Distillation. <laughs> Okay, so there's a paper published in CVPR 2019. <clears throat> it tried to fool the deep learning uh, model, computer vision model. So uh, here are three examples. The first one is that here is a school bus. If the uh, authors trans transform the school bus or rotate the school bus and show just part of the school bus, then the model is fooled. It uh, recognizes this uh, button of the school bus as a garbage truck. Uh, indeed, it looks a little bit like the back of the garbage truck. Uh, then if it see the top of the school bus, then it uh, may recognize this as punching bag. Uh, if the school bus fall down on the road, uh, the model recognizes it as a snow pro. The second example is a motor scooter. 
if the a rotated scooter uh, is in the picture on uh, the model recognize it as a parachute uh, or the bobsled uh, okay uh, parachute again and uh, if uh, here's a fire truck or uh, fire truck if we rotate uh, the fire truck a little bit it recognize it as a school bus uh, or even fire boat or bobsled from those examples, we can see that the AI models can easily be fooled by some change of the real world objects. In fact, the problem has caused an accident in Tesla's autopilot deep learning model, and it has happened in Taiwan on June 1st in 2020. As shown in this photo, there was an overturned truck on the highway, right? And here is the Tesla. The Tesla uh, seems like in autopilot mode. However, it didn't slow down, it continued driving. It seems like the autopilot model failed to recognize the uh, fall down tru truck. From previous examples, we know that the AI models has problem, especially the deep learning models, has problem of recognize the uh, overturned truck. Right? Uh, by the way, the truck was white, so for the AI model, it uh, it find a white box on the highway. The model has never seen a white box on a highway in the training data. So it was confused and decided to ignore the box. Now let's see the video. 米白色大货车横倒在高速公路，内侧车道把整个车道都占住，但却有一辆白色特斯拉直直往前开，一直开，一直开，完全没看到躺在路中央的大货车，连刹车都没踩。高速撞进货车车厢，货车还因此往后
the generator tries to generate fake image based on the random noise input. While the discriminator tries to classify if the generate input or the training data set, if the input is real or fake. In other words, discriminator is a classifier to classify if the input image is fake or real. Okay, the key point is those two network, the generator and the discriminator, are uh, compete with each other. The generator uh, learns to generate more realistic images, while the discriminator uh, learns to identify more challenging uh, fake images. We need to train the models alternatively. So the generator getting a little bit better, and then the discriminator, or then train the discriminator to get a little bit better then again train the generator to improve it a little bit. So uh, do this alternatively uh, until game achieves the equilibrium state uh, when the discriminator uh, can no longer uh, tell the difference between the real images and the fake images. Then we have a strong fake generator which can generate almost real, very similar to real images. Game is a brilliant idea. After being invented in 2014, game has widely uh, been adopted to generate articles, music, images, or videos. It creates many new applications, but also makes some new problems, like the fake news or fake porn videos. The first application of game is super resolution. Today, uh, the resolution of our TV or uh, computer screen uh, are getting higher and higher. Super resolution algorithms can help us to upscale the images uh, from uh, original low resolution to high resolution. But if the algorithm is not good enough, you can see that the upscale the images become blurred. Here is the result of a traditional algorithm called by Cubic. The basic idea behind the upscaling or downscaling of images are, are using the pixels in uh, the neighborhood pixels to do the interpolation. In other words, to do uh, to generate new pixels or reduce the number of pixels, uh, we do the weighted sum of the neighborhood of, of the pixels in the neighborhood. Uh, by cubic, use four pixels in the neighborhood, so it's called cubic. And uh, as you can see, that the image is uh, blurred. Uh, that's a common drawback of the traditional algorithms. By using deep learning models. Uh, we can train the models to know how to generate, generate more uh, clear, uh, more sharp uh, upscale images. Uh, using the residual network, uh, residual network, we can see that the face of the woman uh, becomes more clear, uh, but the details of the head are still not very clear. But uh, using game, we can uh, generate very high quality uh, images. Of course, it requires uh, a, a lot of training time uh, and uh, a lot of memory or computing power to learn the details of the original images and uh, then uh, learn to generate, uh, to select. The game model, the generator, will learn to generate details of the images. Okay. Oh, but note that uh, training game is very difficult. There is no guarantee that the uh, network, the two sub network, uh, will achieve an equilibrium state. Uh, the most popular application of game is to use to generate fake photos or fake videos. Here are some examples. Uh, the photos on the 
left are original photos of uh, Marian Manro or Einstein. And the photos on the right are generated by the adver generative adversarial networks. Uh, as we can see, uh, it's very difficult to tell the difference uh, to tell the uh, difference between fake or and the real photos. Okay, the most famous uh, software is called Deepfake. Uh, many nerds have used Deepfake to change the face of female stars in porn videos. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it, but the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their potential for harm. This is your Bloomberg Quick Take on Deep Fakes. Deepfakes, or realistic-looking fake videos and audio, gained popularity as a means of adding famous actresses into porn scenes. Despite bans on major websites, they remain easy to make and find. They're named for the deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that make them possible. Input real audio or video of a specific person, the more the better, and the software tries to recognize patterns in speech and movement. Introduce a new element like someone else's face or voice, and a deepfake is born. It's actually extremely easy to make one of these things. There were just some supposed, you know, breakthroughs from academic researchers who work with this particular kind of machine learning in the past few weeks, which would drastically reduce the amount of video you need actually to create one of these. Programs like Fake App, the most popular and widely available for making deep fakes, need dozens of hours of human assistance to create a video that looks like this, rather than this. In August, researchers at Carnegie Mellon revealed software that accurately rendered not just facial features, but changing weather patterns and flowers in bloom. This advance is not yet available to the public. But with increasing capability comes increasing concern. You know, this is kind of fake news on steroids, potentially. Um, we do not know of a case yet where someone has tried to use this to perpetrate a, a kind of fraud or an information warfare campaign, or, or for that matter, to really damage someone's reputation but it's the danger that everyone is really afraid of. In a world where fakes are easy to create, authenticity also becomes easier to deny. People caught doing genuinely objectionable things could claim evidence against them is bogus. Fake videos can also be difficult to detect, though researchers around the world and at the US Department of Defense have said they're working on ways to counter them. Deep fakes do, however, have some positive uses. Take Sarah Proc, a firm that creates digital voices for people who lose theirs from disease. Speech synthesis is the artificial production of human speech. There are also applications that could be considered either good or bad, like the many, many deep fakes that exist solely to turn as many movies as possible into Nicolas Cage movies. Oh, hi, Mark. Another promising research direction is automatic machine learning. Here is an example from Google's AutoML. So what is automatic machine learning? So far we have used the graphics car to learn the parameters of neural network. But the neural architecture are designed by scientists, right, or by the researchers. And we start to wonder, if the computers can learn the parameters much better than human, why not let the computer learn the neural network architecture, right? So let's call it automatic machine learning. We will try to let the computer to do the whole things from the architecture, the parameters, and then the tuning the hyperparameters, right? So it's totally automatic. Uh, this research field is called AutoML. Uh, so Google has uh, uh, devoted to this research directions. So I believe other uh, companies are also devoted to this research uh, direction because it is the future. Right? Uh, then the future, uh, we finally let the computer learn automatically. We, they, uh, we don't need 
human researchers anymore. Here is the architecture learned by Google's AutoML. All right, huh? is the first version is called the NASNet. Also, NAS is uh, referred to as the neural network search, neural network architecture search. It's called NAS. How is the performance of AutoML? Here is the result of NASNet. NAS means the net network architecture search, NASNet, proposed by Google. We can see that on ImageNet, the NASNet has already outperformed the human design architecture. All right, huh? It's better than the many famous architecture we have learned, like the Inception, right? Huh? The Exception huh? or other new architecture, ResNet, XT101. Okay, so it has it has better than uh, uh, human design architecture uh, in 2017. A new auto ML model called Efficient NET was proposed in 2019. The idea of Efficient NET is simple. The authors uh, found that there are several factors that affect the accuracy of the model, right? The first one is that the width of each layer, right? The width of each layer, how wide the layer should be. And the second is the depth of the network architecture, right? Usually the deeper the beta, but not necessary, right? We need to find the optimal number of layers in a neural network. And also the for image, the resolutions, right? Higher resolution sometimes gets better uh, better results, better accuracy, but not too high. And so combine these three factors uh, and uh, use the computer to find the best, uh, the optimized uh, parameters of the network, we can get uh, an efficient network. And it's very efficient and accurate. The experiment results of efficient net are here. It's getting better than the last net, right? Well, now it's uh, achieved uh, as high as uh, 84 top one accuracy on image net, right? Uh, so uh, it's outperformed the previous models, uh, including the human design model and the uh, network search by computer on the last net. The idea of efficient net is simple but very effective. Another important breakthrough in recent years is transformer. Okay. Transformer was originally proposed to do language translation, but is now spread to other areas and have achieved better performance than the convolution neural networks, also the LSTM. So uh, it's a, a, a strong trend to use the transformer model in all the uh, deep learning areas. In addition to language translation, researchers have trained transformer models to do many interesting tasks uh, like article generation or uh, even programming. So some uh, researchers have trained transformer to write simple code. So you just tell the computer what kind of maybe uh, web website you want and then it will automatically generate source code of the website. So here is an interesting website called Hugging Face, which can let you try uh, some functions of Transformer. So I try this uh, website, I play with it, I input, uh, I type some text, and then it will auto-complete the whole sentence. This, uh, it will generate different sentence each time you play it. Here is the, my favorite example. I type who is Quentin Lai. 
And then uh, the autocomplete says that uh, Guan Dinglai is the world famous and respected Chinese martial artist of Guan Dinglai. So you can see that the structure and the, the syntax, the grammar uh, are correct. I encourage you to play uh, with on um, hugging base and then, then try to use their API to create some interesting applications. Here are the key takeaways of today's lecture. First, deep learning is a branch of machine learning, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And there are two stages in machine learning. First, training and testing. The gradient design is used to train the neural network models by updating weights to minimize the errors, the prediction errors. And the convolution neural networks are used to recognize images. And the RNN and STM are used to recognize sequential data, such as text or speech. Of course, now people try to use transformers to recognize both images and speech. And the generative adversarial networks are used to generate fake data, like photo or video. The transformer told us that attention is all you need. The attention module is the most important neuron in neural network. And the deep reinforcement learning can not only play Go, but also study new drugs.